Okay, so XAMP is a, a, a pre bundled software that we can download and install on either a Linux system, a Windows system, or even a Mac system. And what it does is it helps, it, it makes this, uh, the process of building a dynamic web server easy. So let's take a look at what a typical web server that would run web <coughs> applications looks like and the components that would exist in, in one. Uh, we have LAMP, which stands for Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP, and the last one is usually uh, marked with uh, uh, things like uh, a scripting or uh, Python. So the LAMP is a LAMP server, and this installation means that we're running it on Linux. So here we have our web browser, and our web browser makes a request to the web server. The web server is typically running some sort of Unix based operating system. And the web server in this example is running Linux, a very popular operating system. Uh, other OSs that would run would be the Sun Unix systems or IAX from IBM. You could put this on a Windows platform, you could run a Windows server, but uh, you have a lot of vulnerabilities, a lot of patching that you would have to do, and it is not as often or frequent that Windows server is used as a web server on the public internet. That doesn't say that they don't exist, but it's just not as popular. Okay, so we have Linux as the operating system, and on Linux, we are going to run Apache. Apache is the actual web server that serves up the web documents. The, the Apache web server is available <coughs> as open source, open license software that you can download for free from the internet and you can install it on pretty much any platform. So it works great on Linux. Now Apache, so that gives the, the web browser when they're searching or, and they, they browse to our website, that gives them the, the ability to see web documents. So in Apache, that's where we have our files or our web doc, our web documents. Great, that shows static web pages. A static web page is a web page that just doesn't change unless the author of that web page goes in and makes a modification to it. So it's just a static, plain HTML document. Well, we can take that static HTML document and we can add code to it that will refer back to a, an application, some sort of web application that will pull information out of a database. So for example, when you log into your uh, MySWTC to look up your account information, you're browsing to a web server that's displaying a login information. You type in your username and password, and then what you see on the very next page is different from what the person sitting next to you sees, correct? Mm -hmm. And that is a dynamic web application, meaning it, the content changes based on who you are and what your request is. And that information that you typed in, your username and password, and the information then that's displayed on the page for you is dynamically displayed based on you, and it comes out of a database. Is that sort of the same way as logging into the same website from a desktop, say from a tablet to where you're getting a mobile? No, there's a couple little different concept there. When you browse to a website with a computer and use a computer browser, 
you see the website, but then when you go to that same website with your phone, your smartphone or a tablet, it looks different. What's happening there is the HTML code that's inside of these files is checking to see what your browser is. It says, oh, this is Firefox running on Windows 7. I'll display the full content website. Or it'll go, oh, this is uh, Firefox running on a Nexus 7 tablet. I'm going to display the mobile site so it fits into the small screen better. So it has two different copies of the website, essentially. Yeah. So that's not necessarily dynamic. It might appear to be such, but what it is doing is just doing a quick check and then displaying to you either the full website or the mobile scaled down website. Um, Squarespace.com is a place you can build your own websites. Uh, and it's uh, you pay I think eight dollars a year, but it has a built-in function to where when you build a website, you build it, and then it will automatically scale it down because it has code built into it for uh, mobile browsers. So good question. Okay, so that moves us on to the database. The database is MySQL. SQL stands for SQL Query Language. It is a process that queries databases and pulls information out of databases. It is, it is a session connection to the database to get that database out. So MySQL is the database which has all of our information or content that we want to display. So this allows us to have a large database that's storing all of the data for our database. So that means that we can change the look of our website without having to change our content. And uh, I'm sure some of us in this room know about CSS. What is CSS? Chris, you guys covered CSS yet? Cascading style sheets? Yeah, cascading style sheets. What that allows us to do is, what's that? <laughs> is what that allows us to do is create a web document that will reference another file that identifies the color of our template, of our, of our background, the color of hyperlinks, the color of text, what our website is going to look like as far as colors and size of fonts and so forth. And then inside of that code, is calls to the database that's going to display the information. So all we have to do is go change the CSS code and bam, our website looks completely different. But the content is all still the same because it's being stored in the database. It's just pulling up uh, like a, out of a database, a table of names and passwords. So it asks for a username and password, you type it in, it hashes your password and sends the, uh, the hash or the, the string of characters that represent your password to the database. The database then checks it and sees if it matches and it sends a response back to the web application which is inside of this file and it says yes it's good and then they forward you on to a next page <coughs> or to the next part of that application that's built in the HTML code. Um, can you explain exactly what yeah, no, a hash is simply taking clear text, putting it into some sort of algorithm, and then you get ciphertext. Ciphertext is a string of, of characters that don't have anything to do with the clear text. So when you hash something, if you hash Aaron and you add two, okay, that's, the, that's my mathematical algorithm you're going to get Aaron too, right? Which is different than Aaron. So obviously a hash on a computer is going to be a much more of a complicated mathematical algorithm and you're going to get different, you know, ciphertext, but that hash is then what is sent to the server. So your password is is hopefully not sent in clear text. It's processed locally that hash then is sent to the server to compare it to the database. 
of where you have stored your password. Does that make sense? And there's other things built into that, and we'll talk about hashes later on in more detail, things like salt and, and, and different algorithms you can use for hashing passwords, like MD5, some of the terms that you might be familiar with or might have heard. Okay, good question. So we have our Linux server running Apache as the web server, which stores all of our files. Then we have MySQL, which is our database, which contains all of the content or information on our, for our website. Okay, and then the actual application is PHP. And this is the point at which hackers like to do things like cross-site scripting or XML injection, SQL injections is within this PHP code, they inject, there, there's, there's a, a lack of checking of, of the information that the user is typing in. So for example, if you were to type in to the username field, you would type in typically your username, which would probably be an email address, right? You know, bob at, you know, bob.com or email.com. And then that information is then sent to the database by the PHP application that is executing this code. Well, what if we put in there search database display list of names into that into the username field? And then the PHP code goes, oh, I've got this information. Great, let me send it on through. And guess what the response is on the web page now? That's what's going to be displayed. A list of all the usernames that exist in the database. Copy and paste, okay, I've got that information. So that's where the PHP code that's written has to be written so it checks and says, I'm expecting in this field an email address. Therefore, I should have some alphanumeric characters with an at symbol and some more alphanumeric characters and a period and some more alphanumeric characters. So that's the simple check that it would, would use before it executes this PHP code. So we go, does this exist? No, they typed in something completely strange. I'm not gonna move forward with processing this code and sending it to the database. Okay, so that's where it's very important that these checks are done on web applications before they're actually processed and sent to the database. Is this the layer where hackers go in and like insert the old code at the beginning? Yes. And send it to the last three digits or something? Yes. Yep. Yep. This is where this is where they would type in the SQL commands that the SQL database will understand. So in the username field they'll put in whatever comma and then they put in the actual SQL code that would query the database or inject or or, or add something to the database with their <laughs> own string of characters. So it becomes part of the code that PHP processes. So the PHP application will process this, this string of code that it normally is supposed to process, but it will also, inside of that code, see this new code that was injected by the, by the uh, hacker or the person trying to do something malicious. Anybody have a question on that? Okay, so XAMPP, gives us the ability to turn any computer, Windows, Linux, Mac operating system, into a web server that has these components. Very simple, very easy. And it's great for test environments, but it's not good for a full live system on the internet. And this is why. We typically want to build our Linux system, our, our, our web server, with layers. I've talked about layers of security. So we want layers. So on the internet, we have the web browser. It makes a request to the web server, right? The web server is Apache. Apache has our files. Those files 
have PHP code in them. That PHP code references another server in our DMZ or our protected subnet. This is a, a, an alternate in-between network that has rules applied that allow certain types of traffic to flow from the web server to an application server. The application server is going to be doing the processing of the PHP code and it's going to request information through another set of rules to our database server running MySQL or Microsoft SQL or some other type of Oracle database that exists in here and this is our internal private network. So we have several layers that are going on here. So a basic rule that could be applied to this first is saying only web server. So only the web server can access the app server. And then here this rule saying only the app server direct to the database server. So it's saying that only the app server can come inside of our internal network and once they come into our internal network they can only go to the database server. So now our database server, what information is stored in the database server typically? Passwords. Usernames, passwords, private information about our customers more than likely right so that is now stored and protected internally here and then we also have a set of rules and this marker is dying a set of rules that the application server does some checks and balances before it actually sends it on to the database and queries the database to pull the information and then to send it out to the web server where the public facing pages are being displayed Yes. On those rules section, is that sort of the same saying like, well, this port will be open or this port will be Yeah, on yeah. These the rules are kind of like uh, your firewall okay. rules. Yeah, and we can have rules on here as well. The interface of the app server can say, I'm only going to accept application requests or queries from this web server on this interface. So this web server has one, two network interfaces, and it's only going to accept requests coming directly from that interface to this one. And this one could have two interfaces, or physically one. I mean, there's a lot of different ways that you can set this structure up. So we've taken this concept of having a web server with all of these components to now splitting them up into three separate physical servers that are in different areas of our network and protected. So this is simple and easy. Yahoo, we got a web server up and running with a lot of great stuff. We can do some cool things. But this is a little bit more complicated and takes some advanced knowledge. So the PHP files in here are going to query the application server here, which is then in turn going to request information on the database here. So the database programmer needs to understand where they're getting the content from and where to make that query to because it's not all local host anymore. It's not all locally right here on the same server, which is a good thing because once Apache gets compromised, now they can access MySQL and, and other access, other things that are stored on this web server. So when one thing gets compromised, you're done. Here, the web server gets compromised Big deal, okay, it stinks, our customers can't get their information, but our app server and our database server are still protected. But if this gets compromised, the only thing they can attack is the app server, and the app server has additional rules. It's gonna make it harder to get through to get access to the actual real meat of the information they probably want is here. So, any other questions? Okay, so what we're gonna be doing today is we're gonna be installing and creating or turning our Windows 7 workstation into a web server 
by simply installing XAMP. X stands for any platform, any operating system. And we're gonna have Apache, MySQL, PHP. It comes with a lot of additional um, tools, <coughs> um, like FTP service and all that kind of uh, uh, services that we want to enable and put on our system. So we're gonna be installing actually a little bit older. I think the newest version right now is 1.81 of XAMP. We're gonna be installing an older version which has older versions of Apache, MySQL, and PHP, just so we have a more vulnerable system that we can play with. Okay, that has more vulnerabilities to it. Uh, 